for the leader, set to sunrise, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from helping me, so far from my anguished cries? My God, by day I call to you, but you don't hear me. Likewise at night, but I get no relief. Nevertheless, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors put their trust, they trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and escaped, they trusted in you and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me jeer at me, they sneer and shake their heads. He committed himself to Adonai, so let him rescue him. Let him set him free if he takes such delight in him. But you are the one who looked who took me from the womb. You made me trust when I was on my mother's breast. Since my birth, I've thrown on you. I've been thrown on you. You are my God from my mother's womb. Don't stay from, far from me, for trouble is near me, and there is no one to help me. Many bulls surround me, wild bulls of Bashan close in on me. They open their mouths wide against me, like ravaging, roaring lions. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart has become like wax, it melts inside me. My mouth is as dry as a fragment of a pot. My tongue sticks to the palate of my mouth. You lay me down in the dust of death. Dogs are all around me. A pack of villains closes in on me like a lion and my hands and feet. I can count every one of my bones. While they gaze at me and gloat, they divide my garments among themselves. For my clothing they throw dice. But you, Adonai, don't stay far from away. My strength, come quickly to help me. Rescue me from the sword, my life from the power of the dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth. You have answered me from the wild bull's horns. I will proclaim your name to my kinsmen right there in the assembly. I will praise you, you who fear Adonai, praise him. All descendants of Jacob glorify him. All descendants of Israel stand in awe of him. For he has not despised or abhorred the poverty of the poor. He did not hide his face from him, but listened to his cry. Because of you, I give praises in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the sight of those who fear him. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek out a night will praise him. Your hearts will enjoy life forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Adonai. All the clans of the nations will worship in your presence. For the kingdom belongs to Adonai, and he rules the nations. All who prosper on the earth will eat and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, including him who can't keep himself alive. A descendant will serve him. The next generation will be told of Adonai. They will come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. And he is the one who did it. Seeing the torchlight glistening off the armor of the temple guards, the eight apostles that were left on the outer portions of the garden fled. Christ returned to the three and found them asleep. He woke them up, but they were too tired to answer him. Returning to the massive bedrock, Christ prayed yet again, My father, 
all things are possible for you. If possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He returned to the three of you and found them asleep. Christ, weak from blood loss, stress, and fatigue, told the sleeping apostles, For now, go on sleeping, take your rest. It is now that the torchlight began to illuminate the area where they were. Christ cried out to the apostles, There, that's enough. The time has come for the Son of Man to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Here comes my betrayer. The students who scrambled to rise to their feet soon saw the flames of the torches, the temple guards armed to the teeth, and their former peer among them. The detachment arrived to find four men dressed in white linen garments and tall oat or prayer shawls, as was traditional for the festival. Christ asked them who they were seeking, which corresponded to legal rights. When they told him, he answered with his identity. This was verified by Judah from Kiroth giving Christ a holy kiss and greeting him. The listener is asked to perceive this holy kiss as more of a kiss of adoration, similar to how certain denominations will kiss the hand of their clergyman. As the guards approached to arrest him, St. Peter drew his sword, cut off the right ear of the Levi Malchus, who was the slave of the high priest. Such an action, though conjectured, probably resulted in St. Peter being seized. Christ, while he confronted St. Peter, healed Malchus's ear by reattaching it. In the chaos, it seemed that one of the guards may have grabbed one of the other two apostles who fled out of his outer robe. The listener is asked to understand that this action constituted as being publicly indecent or what later would be rendered as naked. In the process of securing him, the temple guards bound Christ in chains and led him into the upper city. Pursuing them, albeit from far behind, was St. Peter. The guards brought Christ into the house of the high priest, Cephas, St. John the Apostle, who had a connection to Cephas, met St. Peter at the gate and went in. After St. Peter remained outside the court gate, St. John the Apostle spoke to the Levitical female porter at the gate, vouching for St. Peter. As he entered the courtyard gate, the Levi woman stopped him and asked if St. Peter was one of Christ's apostles, which he denied. Meanwhile, Christ was brought before some of the head priests elders and Torah teachers, or or the written Torah teachers. Ananus questioned him about his apostles. Accordingly, the high priest requested to receive special consideration in such a way that he intended to cover all the bases regarding the summarized body of Christ's teachings and his students. The listener is requested to understand that Ananus was the legal high priest. When he was the officiating high priest 21 years prior, he witnessed the Sanhedrin be confounded by a 12-year-old Christ. As the title is a lifetime title, Ananus is the one that they brought Christ to. Outside in the courtyard, temple guards lit a fire. While St. Peter warmed himself by the fire, Christ was questioned about what he had said in public. Confidently, Christ stated that he never said anything secretly. Rather, he always taught in a synagogue or in the temple. As this was the case, he asked, So why are you questioning me? Question the ones who heard what I said to them. Look, they know what I said. This statement resulted in a slap from a temple guard. Christ asked the guard, If I said something wrong, state publicly what was wrong. But if I was right, why are you hitting me? Outside, a servant girl asked St. Peter about his affiliation with Christ. 
to which Peter denied a second time. Meanwhile, as they took Christ to Cephas, the presiding high priest, St. Peter was extremely nervous. A relative of the Levite, Marcus, a fellow slave, spotted St. Peter and interrogated him. St. Peter denied about being from Galilee and knowing Christ. Suddenly, the sound of a rooster crowing and the stare of Christ at him pierced the tension in St. Peter's mind and soul. Through the gate and into the streets burst a weeping and wailing St. Peter. St. John, along with a small crowd, <clears throat> followed him and his guards to the Royal Stoa across town in the pre-dawn hours. Cephas, the son-in-law of Ananus, had summoned a meeting of the Sanhedrin into the, the hall of huge stones that brought Christ in before the Sanhedrin. However, as Christ stood in the presence of the sages sitting in the semicircle on tier seating, there was another legal issue. Not only could the Sanhedrin not meet before sunrise, but all 71 sages who presided over the nation had to meet. This meeting, though, saw only a handful of members. Nasi Gamel, the elder, who was the president of the Sahedrin, monitored the meeting. As Kafias presided over the court case, several Pharisees sat on their benches. Among these were Nicodemus and Joseph Arama. As witnesses came forward, they were asked seven questions. In which cycle of seven years with Anna Jubilee did the event occur? In each year, the sabbatical year, did the event occur? In which month did the event occur? On which day of the month did the event occur? On which day of the week did the event occur? At which hour did the event occur? In what place did the event occur? <laughs> Most of the testimonies were found to be false or contradictory. As that Joseph Arama and Nicodemus were of the sect of the Pharisees who believed that Jesus was at least a prophet or at most the Messiah, it was possible that they tried to correct their fellow brothers and intervene to no avail. If they did, it is very likely that they were removed. The only two congruent witnesses testified that Christ has said, I can tear down the Lord's temple and build it again in three days. This, though, was not the exact quote, as Christ had said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. This still makes the testimony invalid as it is not, the, as it is not word for word. This testimony, even invalid, was enough to have Christ declared liable for blasphemy. However, Christ cannot be condemned as such needs all 71 sages to meet around sunset. They put Christ in a cistern inside the house of Ananus. This house was later turned into the church of St. Peter in Galatanto. Judah from Kilt who had betrayed him by now had been seized by the, with remorse and returned the $214.80. The elders replied that the money was his problem. Judah, in fury, threw the bag on the floor and left tormented by his remorse. The Sanhedrin was left to debate what to do with the money. Per their misinterpretation, of Deuteronomy 23, 18. They believed the money for a male prostitute and blood money were the same thing. They therefore elected to use the blood money to buy the potter's field as a cemetery for foreigners, in other words, Gentiles. The Potorum, the residence of Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea stood inside Fortress Antonia. This defensive structure was located on the northern wall of the Court of Gentiles. 
Aaron overlooked the roads to Shechem and Jericho. His wife, Claudia Porcula, writhed in a nightmare during the pre-dawn hours. The dream involved Christ, though the nature of the dream is unknown. At sunrise, which was around 6 or 7 a.m., <coughs> the Sanhedrin convened to officially condemn Christ. Christ was removed from the cistern he had been put in and returned to the royal stoa. Cephas, within the bounds of his office, approached Christ in front of the entire Sanhedrin. If you are the Messiah, tell us. Adhering to Exodus twenty-two twenty-seven, Christ responded, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be sitting at the right hand of the authority of the king. Horrified, Cephas declared, Why do we need additional testimony? We have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And at least 40 sages voted to condemn Christ, with only 31 sages voting to acquit him. Among these were Nicodemus and Joseph Arana. As the night to as the right to execute had been stripped from the Jewish government by members of themselves around AD twenty eight, they had to get Roman approval. Around the same time, as the sunlight materialized over the court uh, over the countryside, Judah from Kiroth walked to a tree next to a ledge on Mount Zion. During the pre-dawn hours, he had regretted what he had done. There, he positioned a ladder against the tree. And in climbing the ladder, he tied a rope around a tree limb overlooking the sharp rock face and, and to the other end and wrapped it around his neck. Having been tormented by grief and, and demonic attacks, he felt that he would never be redeemed nor restored. When he kicked the ladder out from under him, the limb broke. Instead of dying by hanging, Judah fell upon the rocks below head first. Meanwhile, <clears throat> the brothers led Christ in chains to the fortress of Antonia. Here, to not become ritually or ritualistically defiled, they remained in the cold day as the prefect Pilate came out to them. Pilate asked what charges they were bringing against this man that they felt it necessary to bring him to him. When they answered, if, that had been, if he had done something wrong, we would not have brought him to you. Pilate responded, you take your magician according to your own law. Upon learning that they intended to have Christ executed, Pilate became intrigued. They have charged Christ with tax evasion, forbidding to give a tribute to Caesar, sedition, subverting our nation, and blasphemy, saying that he is Christ the King. Much to the dismay of the brothers or the Pharisees, Pilate ordered the prisoner to be brought into the fortress so he could interrogate him. Once inside his courtroom, Pilate asked Christ, Are you the king of the Jews? To which he responded, Are you asking those of your own, or have other people told you about me? Pilate retorted, Am I you? Your own nation and head priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Christ, using common logic in his divinity, answered, My kingship does not derive its authority from this world's order of things. If it did, my men would have fought to keep me from being arrested by the Judeans. 
but my king show does not come from here. Pilate, as a rational man, realized that if he was a political threat to Rome, that Christ's followers would have been attacking the garrison. Now Pilate realized that if Christ is a king, it was not a temporal kingdom that he had ever heard of. So then, Pilate responded, you are a king after all. Christ responded in a manner which the biblical commentator Ellicott, relying on the Greek text, clarified thusly, So you say, for I am king, to be a king have I been born, and to be a king came I into the world, in order that I may be, bear witness and be a martyr unto the eternal truth which I have made known with my father. It is not for or it is for this same truth that I will send others to who will lay down their lives for the truth too. The listener is encouraged to understand that this does not only mean active martyrs, such as those of the early church who were executed under the anti-Christian Roman persecutions. It also means the passive martyr who, lay, who lives their life for Christ, evangelizing through small ways or as well as big ways and dies peacefully. Upon Pilate hearing all the evidence and accusations that were presented by the head, by the head priest in the Sahedrin, he asked Christ, Do you comprehend with your ears the great number of testimonies that are against you? Marveling at Christ's silence on the charges, Pilate seemed to have retorted in a half-mocking, half-despairingly tone, What is truth? Before he could get an answer, he departed his court and returned to the head priest and the crowds. The prefect stated that he had not found grounds for the charges against him. The leaders persisted that he had been inciting the nation with, the, with his teachings throughout all of Judea, and he started in Galilee. Herod Antipater's jurisdiction was Galilee and Perea, which, mean, which meant all citizens from Galilee and Perea were held accountable to him. At this time, Pilate questioned if the, pres if the prisoner was a Galilean. After confirming that he was, Pilate sent Christ to his enemy Herod Antipater. Less than 20 minutes later, Christ was brought into the palace of Herod. Since after the execution of St. John the Baptist, <coughs> Herod Antipater had heard reports of Christ's miracles and now wanted to witness one. However, his curiosity was not out of need but in the spirit of entertainment. While Herod questioned him, Christ remained silent and showed no miracle. Herod did not seem to have realized that he was looking at the cousin of St. John the Baptist. Biblical commentator Charles Ellicott, in particular Baptist minister Charles H. Spurgeon, highlighted the nature of those silence. The unbroken silence of the accused must have been strangely impressive at the time and is singular, singularly suggestive when we remember how he had answered Cusius when he had been adjured in the name of the living God. He had spoken to Pilate in tones of a sad gentleness. To Herod alone, the incestuous adulterer, the murderer of the forerunner, he does not the south, the safe, from first to last to utter a single syllable. And Herod thought, let's hear an answer from the great teacher. Let's see a miracle from the miracle man. Jesus may have thought in response, I have nothing, I have nothing for you, the murder of my cousin John the Baptist. Who can, who, he who answered blind beggars when they cried for mercy is silent to a prince who seeks only to gratify his own irreverent curiosity. 
as the Herod priests and the Torah teachers vehemently pressed their case against him, Herod and his soldiers treated Christ with contempt and made fun of him. After Herod tired of the mockery, he sent Christ back to Pilate. As Christ was being escorted back to the fortress by temple guards, Pilate sat in his courtroom. Claudio Pucura, his wife, sent him a message. Leave that innocent man alone. Today in a dream I suffered terribly because of him. Upon returning to Pilate's court, Christ was dressed in an elegant robe. Such an action made both Herod and Tipata and Pilate realize they respected each other's office. Pilate summoned the head, the head priests, the leaders, and the people and told them, you brought this man before me on a charge of subverting the people. I examined him in your presence and did not find the man guilty of the crime you are accusing him of. And neither did Herod, because he sent him back to us. Clearly, he has not done anything that merits the death penalty. Therefore, what I will do is have him flogged and release him. The crowd yelled that they wanted an insurgent named Barabbas to be released and Christ to be executed. Pilate asked them, but what has this man done wrong? I haven't found any reason to put him to death, so I'm going to have him flogged and set him free. As the crowd persisted, he had Barabbas released from his cell, but still under guard. Christ, though, was taken to a court in the garrison, stripped of his under robe, and tied to a post most likely in viewing distance of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Soldiers used a scourge of leather thongs to beat him 39 times, which caused welts and bruises. Little did they know that they were helping to fulfill the Septuagint translation of the prophecy of Isaiah 53, 5 to be fulfilled. But he was wounded on account of our sins and was bruised because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his bruises we are healed. After this, they flogged him with a flagrum, now known as a cat of nine tails. Thirty-nine times. These blows created several lacerations and removed chunks of skeletal bone. It was not just all upon the back, but the buttocks, the hamstrings, and the sides as well. After the thirty-ninth blow, they dressed his disfigured form again and led him out into another section of the Praetorium. Some of the soldiers had twisted thorn branches, possibly from a thorn jibu into a crown. The soldiers forcibly pressed it down upon his head. This crown of thorns pierced into the temporal muscle, frontal belly, superficial temporal artery, and the super temp superficial temporal vein. After this, they put a purple robe on him, put a reed in his bound hands, and sped upon him and punched him while mockingly saying, Awe res After they removed the reed from his hands, they used it to hit him and drive the crown more deeply into his scalp. After suffering this derision and mockery of his kingship, the weakened Christ was led back to the court of Pilate. Pilate came back outside again to the, the Judeans and told them, I do not find any case against him. However, you have a custom that at Passover I set one prisoner free. Do you want me to, to set for you the king of the Jews? Suddenly, a bloodied figure in crippling agony appeared to the crowd, prompting Pilate to say, Look at the man. The head priests and the temple guards started shouting, Put him to death on the stake. Put him to death on the stake. 
Pellet, knowing that he has not committed a crime worthy of death according to Roman law, told the crowd to judge Christ according to their laws. The Judeans answered that he is guilty of blasphemy and must be killed. Though Christ being Galilean had been established, Pilate was still intrigued regarding Christ being the son of the Jewish God. Pilate asked Christ, where are you from? The listener is asked to be aware that the biblical commentator Ellicott suggests that Pilate was intrigued about the nature of his origin. If so, this would be the first inquiry into the Immaculate Conception predating the correspondence of Tyrannus Rufinus with Bishop Laurentinus of Concordia uh, concerning, in part, that same topic. Upon Christ not answering the nature of his origin, Pilate retorted that he had the authority to dismiss the charges and to execute Christ. Even though he served as the Emperor's representative in Judea, Pilate had no authority over Christ's life and death. This is true per Roman law, as Christ was not a Roman citizen. The Sanhedrin, however, were guilty of a greater sin, as they rejected him, handing him over to Pilate. At that moment, the Judeans shouted, If you set this man free, it means you're not a friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king is opposing the emperor. Now Pilate sat down in the pavement. This was likely a throne upon a platform near the stairs leading from the Conondel to, to Pilate's court. Both Barabbas and Christ were brought out into this area and made to stand on either side of Pilate. Though both were under guard, Barabbas most likely was chained to the column. According to the Roman government, a riot was one of the first steps to a rebellion. Pilate and the garrison likely saw that a riot had indeed formed. Still wanting to perform his legal duties as prefect, Pilate began to see that his attempt to release Christ was futile and that he was being forced to condemn an innocent man or suffer death for civil unrest. After setting Barabbas free, an action that can result in his death as well, Pilate had a servant bring him a basin full of water and a towel. As he washed and dried his hands, Pilate stated, My hands are clean of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. To which the leaders, in arrogance and ignorance of the role that they were having, responded, his blood is on us and on our children. This one response meant that these men, their sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons were now liable per legalism for the blood of Christ. Christ, beaten, bleeding, bruised, and weak, was handed over to an execution detail. The stairs leading from the Conde to Pilate's court will later be known as the Scala Sancta, which are housed in the Apostle Palace of the Lentheran. By this moment, many Jews were coming into the city from their camps throughout the countryside surrounding Jerusalem. While many were from Galilee, Judea, and Perea, many others were from Egypt, Crete, Cyrenia, Atolia and Greece. As some pilgrims passed by along the southern wall of the city, they most likely found a broken and eviscerated corpse along the jagged rocks of the rock face below Mount Zion. The body belonged to Judah from Kiroth. The listener is requested to meditate on the following exposition. When Christ called Judah from Kiroth and St. Peter to be apostles, he knew that Judah from Kiroth would betray him and that St. Peter would deny him. 
He taught and loved them both anyhow. Judah from Karoth was the vessel by which the prophecies of his betrayal were fulfilled. Just as St. Peter sinned and had fallen, Judah had as well. St. Peter likely wondered if he could ever be redeemed. When he was, he likely wondered if he could be restored. In John 21, 15 through 22, St. Peter was restored by Christ. Judah from Kiroth likely wondered if he could ever be redeemed. Would not Christ have also redeemed and restored Judah as he had St. Peter? Instead of holding on to a single thread of bleak hope for redemption and restoration, as supported by Bishop Augustine in his 125th sermon, Judah forfeited them both. Furthermore, if Judah from Karoth had refused his role, the betrayal would still have occurred. It would have just been by one of the other disciples. Cepheus was the vessel by which the prophecies of his condemnation by the elders were fulfilled. In fact, if he had truly committed uh, unconfessed sin or had truly defiled his office with innocent blood, he would have died on September 23rd of that year, which was Yom Kippur, during his duties as high priest on said day. His rejection and condemnation of Christ was all part of salvation's plan. If Cepheus had refused his role, the condemnation would have still occurred through some other Jewish leader. Pontius Pilate was the vessel by which the prophecies of Christ's death were fulfilled. He is often demonized for his passive aggressive actions on Good Friday. If Pilate had refused his role, the death would have still occurred through some other political means. Christ had to die to bring about the fulfillment of Genesis 22, 18. Every major player in the Passion of Christ had a role to fill as the physical means by which the plan was to manifest. Therefore, there is no villain of the Passion other than all of humanity. Historically, a criminal only carried his pet bloom to the place of execution. In this location is where the stacks stood embedded in a hole or lay on the ground, awaiting the condemned. Once the pedibloom and the stocks were fixed together, this formed the cross. Tradition says the pedibloom was made of date palm while the stipes was made of cypress. As Christ carried the hundred pound beam of date palm which measured possibly a foot and 11 inches wide, a foot and four inches thick, and 7.5 feet long. Due to his weakened state, the weight of the beam was painful to hold, much less carry. Along the way, the crews led the condemned three through the Valley of the Cheesemakers, which is the middle valley in Jerusalem. In the crowded streets of this section of the city, the soldiers had to fight the cross back. Everyone could read the tetelu or signs detailing the charges or charge of each man. For Gatas in St. Dismas, their tetelu or titles stated their names in charge. However, for Christ, there was no title at that time. As Christ suffered from low blood pressure or low blood sugar, loss of blood, trauma, fatigue, and the weight of the crossbeam, he collapsed. Realizing that he could no longer carry his crossbeam, the soldiers started looking for someone to carry it for him. Upon finding an African man dressed in the Jewish attire for Passover, which they were used to seeing. One of the soldiers called out to him, Hey, you, carry this man's cross. The man, however, looked at him with visible confusion on his face, as the soldier could see this African man named Simon from Cyrene was accompanied by his two sons, Alexander and Rufus. 
It is most probable that the soldier began to get irritated after having to repeat the order. I must say the, the following, which is the probable exposition, is also a conjecture. The centurion in charge possibly noticed and investigated. Even though the Jewish citizens of Judea, Perea, and Galilee spoke Aramaic, not all Jews spoke Aramaic, it's probable that a centurion would have conceived that this Jew might instead have spoken Greek. To address the language barrier, he would have called out to the African with the inquiry, Do you speak Greek? When Simon confirmed, the centurion would have repeated the order in Greek. Now let me return to what scripture says. Forced to leave his sons behind, Simon from Cyrene took up the crossbeam upon which Christ's arms were draped over. Oh, how frightened the sons were for their father, who he himself was likely terrified. Once they were nearing the Shechem gate, several women were mourning for Christ. Turning to them, Christ told them not to mourn for him, but for themselves and for their children, as there were troubling times to come. According to church tradition, there are two moments that occurred on Via Dolorosa at this point. Both of these two traditional occurrences are at least plausible, if not probable. Per tradition, St. Bernice was a woman living in the area of Vila Dolorosa. Seeing Christ's countenance disfigured with blood, sweat, dust, and spittle, she removed her veil. Though this is not allowed by Jewish law, she does this in pious Kestat or Agape. The listener is asked to understand that this Bernice would later be known as Veronica. Church tradition also holds that Mother Mary either approached or observed her son. It is highly probable that she was flanked by Mary from or Mary Magdalene, um, St. John the Apostle, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, as well as Salome, or the mother of St. John the Apostle and St. James the Great. Oh, how the words of Zechariah 12.10 were figuratively fulfilled through the literal tears of this woman. Oh, how the mother Mary's heart was grieved to a possible swoon on Villa Dolorosa. After the possible 12 soldiers, Centurion, three condemned men, and Simon exited the Shechem Gate, they climbed the knoll which stood 660 feet outside the wall. This was a hill by the road leading to Shechem and was there for a public place. This road was used by people coming from the Samaritan Judean border towns who would have seen these men and their executions. Once they were near the summit, Simon was dismissed. It is likely that he fled tearfully and was in a state of spiritual shock while he went to find his sons. <clears throat> the approximately 595.18 pound stipes measuring a foot and 11 inches wide, 7.73 inches thick, and 15 feet long, rested upon the rocky surface. Nearby are others, were other soldiers who had dug holes for the stipes, vertical beams to set down in. The squad leading Christ took him toward the center area of the summit. It's not far from here that Christ was offered gall mixed with wine to drink by one of the soldiers. This action, per Roman custom, was to dull for a time that excruciating pain which was about which Christ and the others were about to endure. All three were then stripped completely nude and pushed down. The listener is asked to understand that crucifixion was done in a manner that the condemned was nude for humiliation. 
Well, guest talks in St. Dismas were bound to their cross beams, cross arms were stretched out. A soldier on his right side drove a five to seven inch spike through his right wrist and into the cross beam. A soldier on his left drove a five to seven inch spike through his left wrist into the cross beam. While in pain, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not understand what they are doing. These two spikes were driven through the transverse carpal ligament, which helped in weight distribution. When the cross was erected, the victim's weight would have caused the spikes to knock against the styloid process or radii. Each squad then dragged their prisoners over the stites, which they affixed to the stipes by way of fixing, of fixing their cross beams to the uprights. While the cross beam of Gestas and St. Dismas were affixed to the top of their stipes, forming a cruz conissa, Christ's cross beam was affixed to the upper third of his upright forming a, a cruz emissa. Each condemned man had their legs bent and a footrest put under their feet, which they would use to push up in order to breathe. While Christ's footrest, which was made of Lebanon cedar per tradition and possibly was around 13 pounds, would help him breathe, the little horn on it would cause pain to the phalanges and metatarsals. Once the correct distance and position were determined, each footrest was affixed to the stipes. For Gestas on St. Dismas, their, their footrests were nailed to their stipes, their legs were bound to their uprights. For Christ, though, the soldiers treated his footrests differently. This wooden object, which would support his feet, was nailed to his upright. Once his feet were crossed, a spike was driven between the first and second metatarsal bones of his feet and into the support, into the foot rest. This would have likely pierced the flexor Hulkus brevis and adductor hulkus of each foot, as well as their connected blood vessels. Now the squads lifted each cross so that it fell into their respective holes. Upon the cross falling into the hole, it would have jarred the condemned man upon it. It is now around 9.20 a.m. at which time the morning sacrifice was being slaughtered and the incense was being burned. As Christ, St. Dismas, and Gestas were suspended over the rocky terrain, people passed by and insulted Christ. The insults stemmed from his remarks about destroying the temple and rebuilding it in three days' time. Additionally, some demanded for him to come off the cross as proof of him being the Christ. Nearby stood the head priests, Torah teachers, and elders who jeered at him by saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Now the squads lifted each cross so that it fell into their respective holes. Upon the cross falling into the hole, it would have jarred the condemned man upon it. It is now around 9.20 a.m. at which time the morning sacrifice was being slaughtered and the incense was being burned. As Christ, St. Dismas, and Gestas were suspended over the rocky terrain, People passed by and insulted Christ. 
The insult stemmed from his remarks about destroying the temple and rebuilding it in three days' time. Additionally, some demanded for him to come off the cross as proof of him being the Christ. Nearby stood the head priests, Torah teachers, and elders who jeered at him by saying he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Off to the side or were soldiers who sat or knelt down to start gambling for Christ's underrobe or nightshirt. Closer to the, the cross in the morning mass were Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, St. John the Apostle, and his mother, as well as Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene. Per Roman custom, the title for guest posts in St. Dismas were fixed to their their uprights. A soldier would have soon come with Christ's title, which was per tradition made of olive. The soldier affixed the title by climbing a ladder and nailing it to the upright above Christ's head. It was possible that letters on this piece of wood may have been three inches high, long enough to or high enough to see a good distance from the cross and possibly even somewhat up the hill. Jesus ho Nazaros ho Basilius thon ho Dei ho Deo ho Jesus Nazaros ho Deo Yeshua Nazaret Melek Yisrael.